Shelly's deepest solace. Do you seek him? You have found yourself among those who roll the dark dice. What you are about to hear happened long ago. A story brought back from the edge of oblivion, dutifully transcribed, and enhanced orally to better captivate your attention. Previously, the team set off for Millmutter's Hope to find the town's missing children. Instead, they found themselves prey to intellect devourers in the bodies of humans. Having discovered the true intent of the servants of the Nameless God, they set off in pursuit. Will the team's resolve hold up? Will odds roll in their favor? Fear the strangers in your midst. Never play games of fate. Dark Dice, Chapter 4, Dead of Night. The tracks from earlier led from the camp eastward, deeper into the dead pines. The team followed Cole, the madman, whose hands were now bound behind his back. After walking for some time, those in front noticed movement up ahead, the glint of eyes and teeth reflected in the dim torchlight. But as they grew closer, the creature gave a low growl and fled from the path. Beasts of the uh, wild here. We need to be careful. These things hunt in packs, and they can be quite dangerous if they decide to attack. They seem to have left something in our path. Seems they were eating something. Nope. All right, still buddy system, guys. Buddy system. I'm assuming you're my buddy now? Me? Yeah, uh, we need to have people that... Sure, come on up here. (laughs) We need people that want to be in melee range to be buddies. Does anyone know if intellect devourers can be inside of wolves? Or is it a humanoid-only thing? I believe they only prey on intelligent creatures. Sure thing. I'm glaring at you so hard right now. Not that wolves aren't intelligent. Hmm. What did you want to do? I, I'll try and get a better look. I'd say I'd stick to the shadows, but at this point that sounds redundant. So I'll just creep up quietly. I'll join you. And it's a 15 for perception. And we have a corpse, dwarven. Upon closer examination... Ias Inskeep noted that the chest was a mere hollow cavity, and that the sinewy innards of the figure's throat had been pulled outward in every direction. The man's tongue was also noticeably absent. Good news, he's not moving. Looks like he's been dead for quite some time, but it's hard to tell. Uh, want to torture this guy? <laughs> As it's post-mortem, I think he's more in your domain than mine. I mean, want to ask this guy any questions? <laughs> Whoa. Let's Whoa. not pull this poor soul back into his, his remnants. Oh, father. Let's see if there's anything on him beyond this hideous scarf. Ias began to step closer toward the dead man and pick through his gore-smeared pockets. He hesitated only briefly before swallowing hard and pushing past the nausea. Mm. That's okay, I've seen worse. No, oh, please, come on. <clears throat> that man... <laughs> Madman! I has discovered a gold in the small money pouch affixed to the dwarf's belt, but nothing else of value or insight into the man's past. Worth it. Yeah, let's just keep moving. I don't think there's anything we can do here. But please, everybody, be on the lookout for the wolves. They might still be hungry. We did disturb their dinner. If they come back, I'll talk to them. There's enough dead stuff around here for them to eat, but yeah. The team continued for some time, and were able to hear the sound of running water in the distance. Distracted, they lost the trail for a moment in their haste to discover the source of the sound, a river. As they turned to return to the trail, Sister Cavern's Fall could just barely make out the shape of a figure on the far side of the river in the darkness and heavy fog. The figure stood tall on two legs, perhaps seven feet in height before slouching into a feral position and retreating into the fog. The team, led by Cole, loosely followed the river for two hours until their path broke away. An additional three hours passed with that incident, marking the eighth hour of travel this evening. It was around that time that Sister Cavern's fall, who was holding Cole's rope, suddenly noticed change up ahead, a clearing where trees no longer appeared in the mist. Her keen dwarven vision, aided by the torchlights of the party, could not see any trees up ahead in the mist for at least 80 feet. All right, I'm going to 
put up my hand and see if we can get everybody to kind of stop for a second. Is everything okay, sister? All right, so can we just double check with this guy that he's leading us in a good direction now that it's been quite a while? Because he could just be leaving, leading us off into some cavern or some crevasse or something. If you um, Did anyone double check he was leading us to where those uh, footprints you found? I did, initially. Initially. Um, it's been a while now. Yeah, I'm going to look around to see if I can find these kids' tracks. Oh, correction. Um, maybe someone uh, better look for those kids' tracks. Just to make sure we're going yeah. the same way. Because, uh, you know, I don't want to look and get it wrong. It's your kid. Okay, I'll do it then. So, oh, bollocks. Eleven. I think I see... Might see a couple of footprints. None belonging to children, but a couple of adult ones belonging to humans or dwarves. The ground is a little more muddy here. Soft. You know, a little bit further up, tracking might be more easy. I'll pick ahead a bit too, look for traps, because I really don't want to walk straight into the mud and suddenly disappear. Thirteen. All right. Further ahead, this mud really does make tracking fairly easy work. No traps, however. I can now see some footprints visible in varying sizes in addition to drag marks. And some of these are children-sized. Any trees up ahead? Not from my perspective, no. Oh, fuck. There's a thick red liquid mixing in the mud in splotches instead of, like, a fine mist of morning dew or whatever you guys get up here in the surface. It's, uh... Uh, So is the thick red liquid blood? Yeah, that can't be healthy. So you checked for traps? Yeah, there's no traps and there's a mix of footprints of children, adults and drag marks. And blood. As if the ground is bleeding. Do any of the footprints go through the puddles of mud? Or puddles of uh, blood? Uh, The blood's everywhere. Okay, so it's not like people fell into quicksand holes of mud. I can't really see anything back here. It's uh, it's like instead of dew covering the ground, there's like uh, a thin layer of disgusting blood in patches. Doesn't appear to affect you if you stand in it. It's just everywhere. You'll see it when you get a bit closer to me. Quick head count. One, two, three, four, five, six... And seven, including Cole. Cool, I'm good. Cole, have you been here before? Uh, n- n- not much further. What? What is this? Sort of gesturing to the ground. This, this is Sikari Bolendri, the gate village. We have to go through... This is just... The gate village, to get to the... the great gate? Yes. The, the old arch is up ahead. How much longer is this travel? To the first arch... Not long now. Maybe a dozen minutes if we hurry our base. Is he telling the truth? Insight. Ah, okay, yeah, great. Natural one. He's probably lying. I think we should make our way to the first arch, and I loathe to say this, Ice Owls, but I think we need to camp. These old bones are not made for such long travels, and I fear that I may soon become a burden on the whole group if we keep marching at this pace. I'm all in for sleeping. (laughs) First watch, second watch, third watch, not it. Not me. Don't look at me. We've been awake since, what, 2 a.m.? And some of us were awake before that. Most of us have probably been up for about 16 hours. Uh, That's what I was assuming. It hardly feels like it's been that long. I mean, I did take a pretty sweet power nap earlier, though. That's what... Well, we've pushed ourselves pretty far. Plus, I'm sure some rest will do well for Sindri's wounds. Well, why don't we get in sight of this gate? And then we can sort of determine what we want to do from there. Agreed. Great. Because if we can get eyes on your kid and he's only like two steps away, we'll grab him and run. But if we have to reassess, then we reassess them. But we should... I mean, you've got this. I mean, you might be old, but you're you're cool. You've got this. (laughs) And I'll I'll put my arm around my cousin. (laughs) I can make I hate it. to be a bad host, but as we get closer, does anyone have something to regag our friend Cole with here, just in case? I'm assuming the yep, the old gag is still around his neck. Yeah, he never, never put it away. We didn't take it off him. You cannot be serious. <sighs> Sorry about this, Cole. Replace it. Uh, good idea. We wouldn't want him signaling his friends. No. Alright, so we're just going to have him lead us a little bit further and then we'll take a break? Yes. Alright. 
I think that is necessary. Okay. You continue on ahead? I want to... I'm going to watch him very closely from now on because I'm not trusting this blood do thing we're seeing everywhere. Blood do. I'm going to keep an eye on Soren. Uh, hold up. I'm sensing something with a perception roll of nine. Father Westpike sensed the presence of a metaphysical foul and oppressive stench that suffocated his senses. As one so connected to the spiritual world, he read or perhaps experienced this feeling once before, but never this powerfully. Uh, I have a strong reason to believe that we are standing on unhallowed grounds. These places are often infested with malaligned beasts, so be prepared. The air was stagnant, stale, and warm, and the team's senses were dulled slightly. The further they stepped into the mud, the more faint whispers could almost be discerned. The ground itself even seemed more pale and gray than at mere paces before. Ugh, I know of no way to consecrate the ground to quite on this scale. Maybe if Sister Scarifold and I work together... <laughs> you think you can dispel such powerful ancient curses? You place too much faith in your gods. <laughs> well, that's a bit rude. You could maybe consecrate a small area temporarily, but don't waste your time otherwise. Uh, sorry, this is a gamey question, but would this, like, make resting more complicated or hard? This unhollow ground? No, what it does is affect turning undead, among other things. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, I... I... Uh, lightly touch on the... Pal uh, on Sister Cavanfall's shoulder, and I say, Do you sense this? This unholy presence we're enveloped in right now? This whole place kind of... Yeah, it's really foul, but I can open my divine senses if you want me to do that. I, I feel we're wandering into either a trap or very close to whatever evil these people are talking about. Pretty much. Would you All right, yeah. So I'm going to, I actually am going to go ahead and use divine sense. I'm pretty sure that this is just going to be like, everything smells like evil here, but we'll find out. Sister Savarite Cavernsfall opened her divine senses and was immediately overwhelmed by the repressive stench and suffocation. Despite this, her firm beliefs prevented the flood of horrors from affecting her psyche. Uh, everything here is evil. There's the man standing in front of me, Cole. Two tieflings, which, you know, infernal blood and beyond that, just generally powerful evil all around us. Oh, okay, first of all, everybody just get a little bit closer because the demon thing that keeps slicing and dicing us is about 90 feet away. <laughs> I, uh, I grab the, the rope that Sister Cavernsfall is holding and I, like, Yank it down so he has to go down on his knees or, like, fall flat on his face. Cole turned just in time to land face down on the mouth. Oh. Oh, that was not my intention, but okay. But otherwise... <laughs> otherwise, Father, this whole place stinks of evil. <laughs> like... The... the... Oh, God. The creature is here? Yeah, I mean, I, it's pretty much been following us this entire time. We knew that. That's why we have the buddy system. Yes, yeah, true. Sister Cavern's false senses adjusted slowly as she stepped forward a few more paces. Straining her eyes, the hairs on her arms stood on end as the faint buzzing grew louder. She could hear that something was inherently wrong with this place, but that a new scent also hung in the air. A stronger, more pungent decay. Something had died here. Is that from my divine sense, or can everybody hear that? No, I hear it too. Would you two feel better if we didn't rest on this ground? Absolutely. You two are more affected by this, than, by this than we are. We do not want to stop here. Whatever unholy abominations... I wouldn't stop here. ...are here, are much stronger on, on this ground. But retreating the other way is just going to bring us right back to Black Three-Eyed Demon thing, so... He called him the Silent One. I raise him up so he doesn't suffocate in the mud. Too soft, <laughs> The wet gag now covered Cole's mouth and nose, greatly inhibiting his breathing. Uh, I'll reach out and do prestidigitation that should clean that mud off his gag. I just don't want you to die. I pull the the, the mouth, mouth gag off him. Are we simply wandering into more unholy ground the further we go? Is this just going to get worse? <gasps> of course. Much death has visited this beautiful place, and blood will precede our ever passing. Yo, man, you got a really messed up version of religion. I don't think... Isn't all religion all messed up? <laughs> you be quiet back there. Now where I'm from, my god is a good god. 
My god is literally the god of sunlight. He can't be evil. Cole, what can you tell us about the Silent One? <laughs> what can I tell Soren that he doesn't already know? Does he Shall I show you how to pray to him? Would you unbind me for that long? I wonder. Come on, we need to move forward. And we're going. Let's go. All right. I don't suppose it's any... It's worth... Um... Going over and having a look at whatever's dead. It might just be another trap like all these other ones have been. We're very near to a place of resting, though, if you are tired. There is an inn, just a few paces ahead. We're going to pass right by it. An inn? I, I think we shouldn't stop there. Mainly because he suggested we should. I, I feel the same. I'd rather take our chances just outside the inn than in a place that he may have set up as a trap. I I swear to you, I would bring no harm toward Ah, shut up. Toward my lord. No, I I think he wants us to reach the end. I think he wants us to reach the resting place of his god. I do. I seek the nameless god. Then let's go. Yeah, but he doesn't need us alive to do it. I said let's go. Yes, yes. Uh I th- if we're not going to stop here, we better get somebody somewhere else and then stop. But we can't just stand here and keep talking. Very true. Um, as we march, uh, uh, Father Westpike makes one last point. I would rather be locked inside with evil people than locked outside with the Silent One. It is true that he is feared by all, even those within the Silent Clan. Shut up, Cole. We don't need your pessimism, too. The team began to sweat as they ventured further into the fog. Within 80 paces, they were able to spot the distinct worn outline of a two-story structure matching the description of the inn Cole had referenced. As the structure came closer into view, it was revealed to be made from stone. A sagging roof sat poorly like an ill-fitted wig, while cracked glass windows were boarded up and backed by dark stained cloth beneath, blocking all spaces that once let light into the building. I am a trained mason. Does it look like this was the original building that was built here by, I think you said it was like the elves, right? That would require a knowledge history check at advantage. That's actually, it's my, it's my whole background and my personality trait is that I tend to talk in length about stonemasonry. <laughs> oh no, not another one. I just haven't yet because there haven't been any stones. <laughs> what about that shrieking rock? You could have gone for hours about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, that's a 19 plus something... This is an older architectural style, pre-Darkland for sure. Perhaps something predating the two kingdoms, but it's definitely of elven design. But the the craftwork doesn't look like experienced elven masonry, but it's not uncommon for elves to have brought in a lot of slave labor. So if I were to hazard a guess, I would say slave constructed, elven design, and despite being in fairly old structure. I'm amazed at the condition it's in, except for the partially collapsed corner. Sister Caverns Fall noted that the empty void where the door once stood, the contents of the building, laid bare to those who'd but venture into the darkness. That. As the team ventured closer, the ruins of a small single-story building came into focus on the right, and to the left, a small crumpled hovel a few meters ahead lie in shambles before a larger single-story building. The tracks in the mud, plainly visible to all, formed a path between the buildings. Some of these tracks still belong to children. They all lead in the same direction through the buildings. They didn't stop here. If you are looking for a place to rest, this is the safest you'll find. One way in, one way out. Can I perceive anyone hiding in the buildings or watching us at all? Notwithstanding an eerie sensation associated with the muted silence... That would require a perception check. Uh, 14. I don't see or hear anything beyond the quiet buzzing off in the distance. Maybe you're up. Okay, four buildings. There's the inn, there's the hovel, and then there's another building with a shack in front of it. Cole, what are the other buildings? The village. I'm curious to see if it was also built by slave labor, but I'll need to get a closer look to investigate. Is this the place of gates? Yes, the gate village. I don't like saying this, but I think we should try out the inn. At least see what the feeling is on the inside. If it's abandoned, then we can just fortify it ourselves and get the rest we need yes. before we go get the kids. I think that's a, that's a decent idea. I think someone ought to take watch outside. I think we're still going to use the buddy system. <laughs> 
All right. I will enter the, the, the inn with Lady Cavern 4. And if another party wants to join us inside... And I look pleadingly towards either one of the uh, any o- <laughs> other the groups, not to send us in alone. No, I will come in. Uh, I will join you. I take Cole's rope from you and hold him outside for a little bit. All right. Uh, so I was... and maybe you'll get a better look at seeing what's around if you boost yourself up to the roof. Hmm. Worth a try. Who wants to hold Cole? No, no I'm. I'm. Uh, no, no, I'm not taking him. That'll be me then. All right, there. there you are, sir. You keep an eye on Saros for us, Soren. And I start walking towards the inn. And I follow close behind. As the team approached the entrance, a wave of rot lingered on the edge of the doorway like a physical wall of heat, assaulting their nostrils. Death had visited this place and left something large in its wake. Ugh, disgusting. <laughs> Those who stepped toward the door had great difficulty maintaining high spirits as questions of the odor's origin clawed at their minds, requiring a sanity check. Fuck. Ugh. This is just... Father Westpike overcame these doubts, however, and put order to his fear, aiding Sister Cavern's fall. I stop in my tracks as soon as I smell the thing, and I just hold out my hand like, no, this, this is not, this is, I don't, something died here. Something massive. Massive amount of death, maybe. All right. So not a good place to sit down for a cup of tea. No... But perhaps our best chance of rest, being outside with the Silent One, is maybe a worse fate than the tavern, the inn. Why don't we go check the other buildings in the area? Yeah, especially the better-looking ones up ahead. Yes, yes, I like the sound of that a lot more. <laughs> and we're gonna walk a nice li- big radius around the, the evil death building. And thus the Dungeon Master skipped five pages of this adventure. You wanted us to go into a building and you're like, it stinks in here, you should probably go somewhere else. (laughs) Well, of course then we'd be like, you didn't make it very inviting for us. As I was saying, the team passed the building, no problem. But did they continue on to the structures on the left or the right? Left. Okay. Ahead, the team saw a shack. The structure was fairly small as it came closer into view, and I need to scroll ahead five pages. I wasn't joking. All right, where'd it go? No. So basically, we have just done the thing where in the horror movie you'd be shouting at the screen going, don't walk in there, don't, and we've just gone, nope, we've seen this before. By the way, I'm calling it the the gimmick to save the story is in the stupid fucking inn. No, nothing too important, perhaps. Only death. Or perhaps not. You'll have to wait until I release Domain of the Nameless God as the campaign module on Drive Through RPG or our Patreon, wink wink. From the far side of the inn, the team could make out the worn stones of an expansive graveyard. We can head towards the shack, we can head towards the graveyard, we can head towards the building behind the shack. And what's our plan, old man? I think the building is our best bet right now. The shack or the building behind it, just for clarification. Uh, the building, right? And I look pleadingly to Sister Kevin Fold not to take me to the shack or the graveyard. <laughs> I'll just follow you. <laughs> yeah. As the team approached the building, they could see its cracked windows had been blown through, perhaps vandalized, burned. And as they cautiously glanced through the window, they noted that they could see clear through the building, as though the far wall had long since either eroded or been torn down. The interior now exposed to the elements save for scanned portions under the safety of the roof. So the graveyard extends to the back of the inn, to beyond visibility well past the structures, and the tracks seem to go through the graveyard. Of yeah. course they do. <laughs> As Soren took a closer look, he noted a lone wooden coffin with a shovel leaning against it. The aged wood sat directly atop the earth, next to a deep pit that looked only recently excavated. Some of the graves appear to have been disturbed recently. Perhaps made ready for new additions. I'm not sure if that's a good sign or, uh... Oh, boy. This unholy ground, the open graves, this is not a good place. Over there, that headstone near us has been defaced, stained with dark liquid. It might be some kind of writing, but I can tell from this far away. Hmm, looks almost like infernal from here. Ayas, you, you speak this language of Eternals, which we seem to be running across. Can you read whatever that stone says? I'd have to walk closer, but yeah. Will anyone uh, come with me? Oh, not, I was not going to let you go alone. Okay, so Father Westpike and I will move closer. 
Yep, it is written in Infernal. It's a message, two lines of text. Hi zig sui hafir wayuls, mort zi ozu oe haf da hafwik ma. He tastes your scent, he waits for you, do you seek him? Right, it's a recipe. Well, as they say in the Darklands, a headstone is as good as a cookbook. What does that even mean? It's a Darklands thing. <laughs> sure. All right, well... Well, nothing too... Uh, evil, I assume. Maybe this place won't bother us if we stay here as short as we can. Well, it says something about tasting scent and whatever it was saying. I'm sure you all heard that when I was translating it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Did you translate it out loud? Uh, I did, yes. You read aloud from something written on a stone. Ugh. It's a line in the sand. You don't read aloud from things like this. Right. Okay, well, um, lucky shot, I guess. If it tastes your scent, it will come for you. Wait, what? Okay, what did we find? There was a message in blood on a defaced headstone that said, He tastes your scent. He waits for you. Do you seek him? You see, the creature... All right, then bit, uh, Soren. It has his scent, maybe? Could be. I'm pretty sure after it slashed me, too, I actually heard it whisper, do you seek him? Seek him? So the Silent One and the Old God is not the same thing. All right. Hmm. No. He is just one of his chosen disciples. One is the guardian for the other, if I remember rightly. Yes. As I said before, he is the guardian, the gatekeeper of the resting place of the nameless god. So is everybody okay if we knock him unconscious and get our naps in and then go save these kids? Absolutely no problem with that. I think it's unnecessary to resort to violence. A simple gag and an outlook, a uh, lookout, would be suffice. Let's do that then. All right. We need to set up some decent watches. Someone should be watching him and Soren, and someone should be watching now. So we're staying inside the house? Yeah, the, the blown out of house. As the team reached the open side of the structure, they had a full view of the cart inside, filled with stiff, putrefying bodies. The cart, located directly underneath one of the windows, which obscured it from previous view. Oh, great. No, oh, no. Do you think they were collecting the dead for burial or something more sinister? As Sister Caverns fall there at a glance, she was simultaneously sickened and mesmerized by the multitude of writhing maggots, centipedes, and earwigs gorging themselves on the sticky flesh. She broke her gaze only after confirming to herself that they appeared to be long dead for over a month. All right, I push... I, I turn Rowena around, one quick hand movement, and start pushing her towards the shack. All right, let's check out the shack. The That surely can't be full of corpses too, right? I've got no problem with that, no problem with that. Let's, uh, let's have a look at this then, and we'll have a look at the shack. Rowena approached the shack and pulled open the door with some effort. With no windows, it appeared to be a small shed, complete with gardening buckets and tools. She regretfully noted that it was only large enough to accommodate, perhaps, two dwarf-sized occupants. Nope, this is definitely not large enough for us. You say there are some tools in here? What kind of tools? They're just gardening tools for the most part. Very rusted, sadly. Damn. What about the other building on the other side? Only one way to find out. As the team cut through the graveyard on their walk toward the far building, they passed the large wooden coffin and the hole adjacent to it. I would very much like to grab the shovel, and then I want to look down the hole. I'll uh, also take a glance. Just like <laughs> grabbing the shovel and then looking down the hole, so I'm very much holding the shovel ready to hit if anything is down there. <laughs> I'll just take your word for whatever's down the hole. I'm going to be watching the coffin very closely while this happens. Within the hewn earth of the pit, a small coffin was gently nestled, fully visible as though it had been laid to rest, but no service given, and no dirt placed over it. And those who looked into the hole could see a sword resting atop the coffin. Even from within this dark place, the sword seemed to give off a faint glimmer, amplifying the dim torchlight in Soren's hand. Cole, do you know what that sword is? I've never seen it before. If Soren and my cousin, and in fact, if anyone's nearby, I'm just going to chuck the, the shovel at whoever's nearby, hoping they catch it, and I'm going to go down and grab the sword. Fuck it. Oh, God. Okay. Rowena jumped into the deep hole, the coffin's wood absorbing all sound from the impact. As she leaned down, she noted that the sword had elven runes engraved on its side. Cool. I read elvish. Yeah. 
Shaliosi Thysrael. Bane of the Nameless in Elvish. Let me think. Does this Bane of the Nameless ring a bell with me at all? Is it from myths and legends and lore? 13. Well, uh, it probably has something possibly to do with the Nameless God or his followers. And since this god is called the Nameless God and I don't remember hearing too much about it, perhaps it's tied in with that. And if it's the Bane of the Nameless, either it means it's a Bane to him or it's his actual Bane. Like, ah. So I'm going to look up and I'm going to say... It's either going to bite me or it's not. So what do you reckon? Bring it anyway. Bring Open it anyway. With stick first. Well, I'm assuming at this point, uh, Father Westpike is running and doing like a scratch stop thing above the grave and it reaching his hand down like, get out of there. Are you just waving? Are you joking? No, I mean, it says Bane of the Nameless. I mean, it's just... You get out of the grave. Get out. Take my hand. It's a sword that's... This grave lacked a headstone. It says Rowena on it now. Who are you how it I've got it to I'm gonna like like kind of jig off my shirt. I have leather armor on. It's not weird. I'm gonna jig my shirt off and then pick it up with my shirt and then hand it up, hilt first, to my cousin. It's like you can pull me up with this bit. Just give oh. oh, don't do that with a sword. What? I try to reach I don't know if I can, but I try to reach down to her hand and lift her by the hand. It's a little bit too deep. It's like eight feet. Eight foot? Bloody hell. Ayers, please. I said it was deep. See, take the sword and then I'll climb out. Yes, please, please. And I grab the sword. Father Westpike grabbed the sword and examined it briefly while holding it with Rowena's shirt. It's, it's, it, you're still holding it by my shirt. It's all good. It's all good. Yes, it's in the shirt. And now I will try and stubbornly climb out myself. And as Rowena tried to move her feet. Ah, oh, shit. She discovered that they were stuck to the coffin. Initiative. Oh, shit. Yes! Natural 20! 20, 24! I'm too busy holding the sword. Like, what the hell are you doing? Our blessing is gone, isn't it? Unfortunately, yes. Hashtag no longer blessed. Hashtag no longer blessed. As Rowena Granipike tried to move her feet, they appeared to be stuck to the surface of the coffin. While she initially thought herself stuck to a splinter or perhaps sap, her fixation quickly turned to terror as the coffin itself transformed into a giant maw. <gasps> Rowena had heard stories of the shape-shifting creatures in the past called mimics, and as she realized that she had just jumped on top of one, her heart sank, which required a sanity check. Oh no! But if I live, this is going to be the greatest story known to man. Um, 15. Hell yeah. The ultimate caveat to good stories. If I live... If I live, this is going to be the greatest story to dwarves all over, that they are stood on a mimic and lived. But this story starts by me climbing out of the bloody grave. The rabid, frothing maw bit Rowena's shoulder grazing her for five damage as she struggled to escape the creature's adhesive surface. Nineteen. Rowena had disadvantage, requiring her to roll a second time. Well, that was more, so nineteen. Really? Okay. Rowena struggled and grasped handfuls of mud, throwing them on her feet, loosening the adhesive grip until she was able to grasp a tree root and pull herself free of the hole. Come on. The creature let out a hideous bellow from below, and those above began to notice shambling figures seemingly drawn toward the sound. Stumbling, shuffling forward, the team could spot five of them. I want to give my cousin my last bardic inspiration for the day, if I can. Um, let's see. All right, all right, now you can have a go. Go and open that big bag of I told you so. And then I'll give him bardic inspiration. As the last notes played, a loud crunch burst forth from the coffin. The only warning before an explosion of splinters and rope shattered in all directions. From within emerged a hairless figure, tall, pale, starved, a clearly muscular. Any notion that this creature might be friendly was instantly dispelled in a mere glance at its hungry glare, sharpened claws, and massive fangs. From the team's rough circle formation around the grave, the distant figures shambled closer. A creature concealed in muddy robes stood near the edge of vision as if content to simply watch the others move forward. Sorry, to clarify, there were two coffins. There was a coffin inside the dirt, in the hole, and there was a coffin above ground with a shovel next to it. When she took the shovel, passed it to the person, she jumped into the hole where the coffin was intended to go, but there was already a coffin down there which wasn't really a coffin. Right, looks like I'm going to be doing some rapiering. 
So, let's start with an 18 and 9 damage. Iasin's keep jumped from his hiding place among the graves and stabbed the snarling creature in the chest. The hit stopped the creature's advance, but it didn't seem to pay any heed to the dark river that trickled down its chest, nor the tiefling. With a flash of green-blue light, Filgia transformed her gnarled staff into a formidable weapon, elongating the curved hook top, hardening the edge, and adding inch-long spikes down its length. As she swung the still-moving weapon toward the hairless creature, it sidestepped her attack, which was telegraphed by the display of magic, and it swiped toward Sister Cavernsfall, who blocked the incoming strike with her shield. I will just uh, make an attack here and not do anything weird. Soren hit the closest figure in the chest for seven damage, causing chunks of powdered flesh to explode in a haze of choking nausea. Her flesh, desiccated and shriveled, clung tightly to her bones. She continued to shamble forward as the other three, sickly and disgusting, followed suit. One was bloated and sickly, a constant stream of black drool running down its maw. The other's eyes had been sewn shut, and more recently forced open, the resulting damage sickening. The final creature's abdomen was clearly hollowed out, and home to a glass jar filled with an opaque liquid. As each step shook the liquid, the team could just barely make out the form of something disgusting, writhing in the liquid. As if drowning. I can see a lot of things disgusting. Behind the team, the mimic scrambled to pull itself up from the pit and lashed out at Rowena. Thanks to the quick actions of Sister Cavern's fall, the attack was knocked back with a parry. I speak the name of Pelor, the god of sunlight, banishes all of these creatures, and I am casting cast on uh, turn on death. No, you. At minus four. At minus four. The light around Father Westpike seemed muted, and only the shambling creature with the disturbing eye sockets seemed repelled. The monster gave a reproachable gasp and raised its hand over its face. It seems like the hooded figure in the back is countering my prayers. <laughs> Who is Cole? That was Ayas before. Ayas Hinskeep failed his strength check with a roll of three, and Cole pulled away, <laughs> running in the opposite direction of the attackers. Okay, screw it. I'm I'm just going to look at the mimic and just like, like strum a G minus seven or something by accident. You're really ugly. I better hit you with a thunder wave. I'm going to push your ugly ass back into a grave. Eight damage. With a deafening crack of sound, the mimic was cast back into the grave. Nailed it. Clearing teeth loose and bruising its naturally purple skin. Stay back, fiend. Non-natural 20. Seven. Sister Cavern's fall glanced at the tentacles of the mimic creeping up on the sides of the grave and struck it in a series of blows with her warhammer. As she struck, one of the larger tendrils went limp, causing the creature to fall back into its grave, pulling dirt and rocks with it. 17 to hit, 6 damage. Invigorated by his previous successes, Aya struck the hairless creature again with his rapier, this time opening up a wound across its abdomen, slowing the creature down. But as the hairless creature's blood hit the ground near Sister Cavern's fall and Aya's inskeep, they were both forced to resist the effects of the blood's putrid odor. Which Aya did, but Sister Cavern's fall could not. But I have advantage versus poison. Or could she? Channeling a silent prayer, Sister Cavern's fall was able to overcome the poisonous favors. Ha <laughs> ha I'm a dwarf, guys! We're all dwarves up in here! It's all good! The monster in turn retaliated, slashing wildly at Ias. Its massive talons set a path for his head. But Sister Cavern's fall suddenly materialized between Ias and the creature, taking the full brunt Holy. of the swing with her shoulders thanks to the legendary relic in her possession, the Helm of the Martyr. Thank you, sister. It's my job. Tarum dice! In an instant, the hooked staff in Filgia's hands transformed into a blade of fire. And as Ayas pulled back from his attacks, she swung in a wide arc, <gasps> dropping the beast down to its knees and inflicting nine fire damage. Breathing in from the exertion of her swing, she found herself under the influence of the creature's poisonous blood and found difficulty recovering her breath. The uh, shambler with the jar of liquid inside of him. Soren Arkwright let loose an arrow that cracked the glass, passing through the spine of the creature. The Shambler still managed to maintain its forward momentum, but stumbled as it eagerly tried to bite and swipe at Soren, landing near his feet. The decaying woman, arrow still firmly lodged in her chest, had better luck, digging the edges of her frayed fingernails into the skin of his shoulders. As Soren shoved her away, breaking loose fingernails in the process, he took four damage. At the same time, the bloated man raked his teeth ineffectively across Father Westpike's chainmail, pearlescent teeth ripping free of their gums as a thick, black liquid began to fall and fester from his jaws. 
The hooded figure, moving with inhuman speed, stumbled closer, rapidly closing the distance between itself and the team. In the grave behind them, the mimic regrouped and made another attempt to pull itself up. I think I'm gonna cast the bless. I think that's the best plan right now. We are in quite the pickle. So raise your hand if you want a bless. I will always take a bless, but you can't see my hand. Travis wants one, Ice wants one, and... Filga. All right, uh, the three of you get a bless. May the light of Pelor guide our actions. You said Travis gets a bless. Did you mean me? Yes, that's what he meant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Lady Travis. Yeah, well, marriage makes you into one person. That's some truth there. <laughs> Don't worry. Don't forget. Oh, yeah. Uh, Caitlin, sorry. Lady Travis. <laughs> well, then, Travis, I hope you know you're Mr. Caitlin. Mm-hmm. That's fine. We knew this. Uh, is that your turn? Yes. Cole fled from Father Westpike's vision into the mist beyond. Oh, fuck. Oh, right. Yeah. Cole's, I'll, I'll... Cole's, I want to give that sword there a play. Here, hand it over if you're going to do bugger roll with it. And I'll take... Uh, yeah, I basically... And I'll take the sword out of his hand. Yeah, I... Yeah. I'm proficient in most of these stupid ass weapons, partly because what well, I am, uh, my background and being a dwarf, I'm proficient in pretty much most weaponry. Ah, and it's a short sword, so that's even better. Rowena could feel the distinct magical power within the short sword of plus two. Holy crap! Uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go slash this thing in half, man. Twenty six, seven. As Rowena struck the shambling creature near Soren, she shattered the canister in its stomach, sending its liquid contents spilling to the ground. With a rush of liquid, the small fetus fell too, twitching and moving toward Rowena. I am gonna punt you. Rowena launched the fetus into the mouth of the mimic with a kick, and looked back at her cousin with a wicked grin. See, this isn't so bad. Sister Caverns fell struck toward the hairless monster, but her attack was poorly timed, and the beast batted the blow aside, leaving an opening for Aias. Moving quickly, Ayas cut open the creature's cheek with his rapier, dealing ten damage and knocking one of its fangs into the ground. With an impressive series of rolls, Filgia jumped over the hairless creature, turned, and landed a powerful kick, sending the creature toward the hungry jaws of the mimic. As her teammates dodged out of the way, the mimic bit deep into the pale monster and pulled it into the darkness of the grave. Thank you. Soren silently found what just happened incredibly badass. As for myself, I am going to, uh, stop targeting fetuses here. I think I've had my fill. Time to target the hooded guy and uh, make him both my hunter's mark and slayer's prey. A hideous shriek erupted as an arrow passed into the front of the dark hood, impacting with a solid crunch where the figure's face would have been. However, as the impact from the arrow knocked back the hood and robe, it revealed a bloated gray body, not breathing but rather pulsing, a form comprised of wriggling, feasting maggots pulsating atop thin flesh, as centipedes and flies burst forth from the wound in its face, crawling from the hole in its forehead back inside the skull through its ear and eye sockets. Its sagging skin seemed to form a loose grin. All who looked on this horrific visage had their sanity tested. Thank the Lord. Soren and Father Westpike steeled themselves against this creature. However, Rowena... Natural one. ...took 15 sanity damage and became frightened, the corpse feeding her fears, reminding her of the possible fate of her father. Ugh, keep it away from me. As fast as the maggot-ridden creature's hood fell, it was upon Soren, slashing wildly at his arms and spewing forth a stream of maggots, cockroaches, spiders, centipedes, and black, vile ichor for seven necrotic damage and four slashing damage. As the living stream of putrid filth fell into his beard and clothes, Soren was able to scrape them away before they were able to dig further. His motions allowed him to dodge the reaching hands of the decaying woman and the abomination with the empty glass stomach, while the bloated man's hands raked their bleeding fingernails uselessly across Father Westpike's darkening armor, sharpening their now protruding bones. Behind them, the sounds of a sickeningly raw meal being consumed could be heard from within the grave. Taking a moment to center himself, Father Westpike focused his mind, drew himself back, and struck the abomination with his hammer, closing the gap where its stomach should be. A dull crack set free the upper half from its legs as both segments separated and fell to the ground. Kick it down the hole! I think that... I'm busy! So, I'm going to cast Shatter approximately 10 feet in front of me, which should hit the Shambling Horror, and it will hit the big, magnety, horrible mess that's in front of Soren as well, without hitting either one of us. 
You're pathetic, undead lives don't matter, and upon you, I'm gonna cast Shatter. The upper half of the abomination on the ground was shredded in a deafening explosion of sound and force, and it ceased twitching for good moments later. The same blast badly damaged many of the creatures that comprised the maggot-ridden horror, and caused the desiccated woman to explode completely, as her skin became a cloud of powder. Soren and Father Westpike's constitution was tested. Sorry. Sixteen. However... Thanks to the magic of Rowena's bardic inspiration, the mist didn't seem to affect either of them, unfortunately. I mean, fortunately, they were very, very fortunate. As the ringing from the explosion faded from their ears, Sister Savorite Cavernsfall and Lady Rowena Granite Pike looked up from the carnage at the bloated corpse and the maggot-ridden feet. Wait, it's not dead? Fuck. The creature of maggots. Great. Now it's just spewing maggots everywhere and worms and earwigs and silverfish. Well, that's disgusting. Ugh, I hate those. Sister Cavernsfall and Iasin's keep pressed their advantage as the creature stood, still in shock from the shattering explosion, and struck the creature in the head with a warhammer, breaking its neck and stabbing it through the heart with a rapier. The creature seemed hardly worse for wear, as its head was still attached by a flap of skin, and its wound from the rapier produced little in the way of blood. Filgia swung her flaming blade at the sickly bloated creature, but was forced to pull her attack to avoid a stream of vomit as grainy coagulated blood and phlegm left its nose and mouth. The creature lumbered forward recklessly toward Filgia, who was able to dodge out of the way. I will uh, go for maggots, man. The keen eyes of Soren Arkwright saw a particularly large mass of insects wriggling within the flesh of the creature's shoulder, and let loose a precise shot that devastated the creature but failed to kill it. Enraged, the shambling mass pushed Father Westpike out of the way and swung toward what it perceived as the source of its damage. Rowena. Her mind swam with visions of her father as it flailed wildly toward her, but the creature's bony claws and biting fingers brought her back to reality as they tore through her arm for seven slashing and seven necrotic damage. Rowena dodged the second swipe, but was caught off guard by a surprise wave of spewing maggots and worms. Rowena was able to use her cloak to brush aside the insects and haste as the... Ew, 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 don't like this. This is gross. It's disgusting. I'm not having this. Relax, you're fine. Keep attacking. No, no, I'm not. I'm covered in maggots. This is gross. How the hell is this fine? Father Westpike is going to bring down his holy hammer. No, wait. He's going to cure his cousin. Burger the Yosk Vudana. You're my hero. Why don't you pick on someone your own side, maggot fiend? As the light left Sindri's hands, mending Rowena's wounds, he pushed himself between Rowena and the monster. Something says you beware, but I trust you and I care. Extending a hand towards Soren, Rowena's magic began to heal the worst of his wounds. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. It's still a bit weird and you're a bit off, but oh, you're welcome. I understand. So, <laughs> Rowena is going to activate her shroud. So the, the cloaks on her shoulders is literally going to just come alive. It's going to fly off her back and it's going to start wailing down on that maggot creature. The color drained from Rowena's face as she permanently lost three hit points, and the leathery shroud moved with the life of its own toward the maggot fiend. What? I'm still at disadvantage, right? Actually, this doesn't have disadvantage. This is technically not you. Cool. Um, Well, it was a natural 20, so... The creature was immediately crushed as the cloak folded itself around the largest mass of the swarm and squeezed it into a pulp before returning back to Rowena's shoulders. None the worse for wear. The remaining insects at the feet of the team shittered and scattered as they were crushed underfoot by vengeful Sister Cavern's fall and Iasinski, who aided in the crushing of everything, except the silverfish, because they secretly feared those the worst. So do I lose it off my maximum hit points? Yes. Oh dear. Maybe I can't do this 29 more times. I, uh, I kind of look about, hoping that nobody nearby noticed that. I am staring at you with glaring eyes. We'll have a talk about this once we're done with whatever that thing is! Remembering the remaining threat, Sister Cavern's fall came to the aid of Filgia and struck the bulk of the remaining bloated shambler for four damage. <laughs> Following suit, Ayas cut a bloody swath across the back of the creature, <laughs> putrefying black liquids bubbling from the wound and causing 13 damage. Yeah, that's kind of gross. Only kind of. Okay, it's extremely disgusting, but I've seen worse. The monster distracted by its new attackers. Filgia used this opportunity to pierce it through the middle with her flaming blade, pulling the hilt up along its torso, slicing it very nearly in half. 
going up like a massive Christmas tree. A fiery Christmas tree. A fiery Christmas tree for Wiccans. Does does all the black liquid become... Yeah, I was, <clears throat> was uh, just thinking that. As the putrid bubbling flesh caught on fire and sent a choking smoke around them, Gross. the entire party's constitution was tested as the black burning liquid made its way toward their lungs. Oops. All but Rowena seemed unaffected by the smoke. <coughs> the black smoke burned Rowena's tongue, burned her cheeks, burned her lungs. And all at once she began to feel dizzy and the world began to fade from view. Dark Dice, Episode 4, Toll of the Dead. Starring Caitlin Statz as Sister Savarite Caverns Fall, Peter Lewis as Soren Arkwright, Ethor Vithyarsson as Sindri Westpike, David Alt as Ayas Inskeep, Kessie Rilinicki as Flugia the Witch, M. Cleveland as Lady Rowena Granite Pike, and Travis Fengroff as Dungeon Master, featuring guest voice Eric Nelson as Cole, and transcriptions by Hem Cleveland. This episode was co-edited by Pacific S. Obadiah, Sarah Baczynski, and Travis Fengroff, with sound design by Travis Fengroff, and mixed and mastered by Sarah Baczynski. This is a Fool and Scholar production. Thank you for listening. <laughs>